Hello, Crossroads family. Uh, Christy and I are really excited to be part of a church that is challenging people to make a difference uh, right here in our own backyard and across the world. And we're really excited about this initiative to transform a village by sponsoring a kid. It's a journey that we've been on for quite some time and we'd love to share with you about that right now. Yeah, the journey began for us in 2009. I went on a mission trip to Kenya, to the Narok area actually, and through that trip, I came across a family that I met through a crazy set of circumstances. It was a widow and her children, and God just placed Elizabeth, her oldest daughter, on my heart. Through that trip and then the months following, God continued to just challenge me. I wrestled with the question of why do I live where I live? Why do they live where they live and have the struggles that they have? I knew that the struggles were real, like I had seen them. It wasn't a child sponsorship sitting on a table at a Christian concert. This was very real to me. It had become very real and very personal. And I felt like I was accountable at that point. I also, uh, our family was on the way home from a trip and we stopped at a church and the sermon, the pastor challenged everyone to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone and to go long and deep. And I just felt really challenged to start asking who is our one. And through that, God just continued to impress upon me Elizabeth. Elizabeth and her family were our one and that's where our journey began. Over the past several weeks, we've been sharing with you about this opportunity that you have to find your one, to sponsor one child who can make a difference in that child's life, in a family, in a village, and and to transform a village just by making a small sacrifice every month that can make a profound impact in their life, not just for here and now, but really for eternity. So uh, right now, Andrew Bondurant is going to be teaching from God's Word. He has an interview with uh, some people right here from Crossroads, as well as our partner in Africa, Hope, to help uh, equip us to say yes to making a difference in this uh, child's life, uh, transforming a village through child sponsorship. And I hope that you'll say yes. Well, it's been a pretty active weekend here at Crossroads. In addition to the Transforming Village Initiative, which we'll talk more about here in a little bit, and Time Change, which if you made it here for the nine o'clock service at 10 o'clock, glad you stayed the extra 45 minutes. Um, If you came on time, congratulations. You set your clocks ahead. You are a winner today. You get a cookie on the way out. Actually, they're donuts this morning. Grab one on your way out though. Those are just for you. Um, But in addition to that, we also had a youth retreat called The Weekend, and we had 157 students joining us for that. And uh, I just thought as we got going today, it'd be a neat opportunity for us to pray over our students. So I'm going to ask the students to stand. Um, And if you're a student elsewhere in the room, you didn't go and you want to stand, we want to pray for you as well. All right. And leaders, if you'll join me just engaging with the students around you, that would be great. But let's join in prayer together. Father, I thank you so much for these students, God. God, I thank you for the way that you are at work in their hearts. God, right now I'm trusting that you um, awaken some students to uh, what you desire for their lives, God. That you show them that you have a purpose for them. And God, right now, I pray that you will give them the faith to take next steps, God, to allow this not just to be a weekend where they had a great experience, but for this to be a pivotal moment in their life, God, where they can look back to and say, it was at the weekend, March 6th, 7th, and 8th, 2020, that things became real. God, give them that faith, give them that boldness to step out and take whatever those steps are, God, to share their story with those around you about how you are at work, God, so that you can become famous. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of John chapter 4. 
You can use the Bible from the seat back in front of you if you want or under your seat, depending on where you are sitting. But we are going to be in the book of John chapter four all morning today. And uh, as we do, we are continuing our journey through the gospel of John. We started in the gospel of John the first weekend in January, and we will be in the gospel of John the last weekend in December. So if you've been here with us uh, throughout this year, I hope you're getting comfortable in the gospel of John because we still got a long road ahead. And if maybe you're new with us, start getting comfortable because we're going to be in here for a while. But it has been such a neat journey Uh, for me personally. I've loved learning a little bit more about Jesus as we've walked through this. Now, our mission as a church is to live and love like Jesus. We believe this is what God calls each and every one of us to. And that's one of the reasons why we chose the Gospel of John to walk through, because we decided that there's no better way to learn to live and love like Jesus than to look at Jesus' life. At least we hope that's the case. So we are excited for this journey. And today we are jumping into John chapter 4. And we are actually going to spend three weeks in the first 42 verses of this chapter, looking at what is a pretty well-known story. And as we do, we're going to look at it through a few different lens. But this weekend, we are looking at the story through the lens, asking the question, how did Jesus live in love? What do we learn in this passage about how Jesus lived in love, how he lived his life, and how he loved those around him? Second question that I want us to wrestle through is how is it that we are actually made able to live in love like Jesus? What is it that happens that makes that a possibility? And then finally, what's one step that we as a church body can take towards living and loving like Jesus in our everyday life? So we're going to be John 4, verse 1. Follow me. We're going to read the first six verses here where John records this. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So here we see that John the Baptist continued his ministry and his calling, announcing that Jesus was the Messiah, the one that God had promised to send, the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament. And as he did this, the Pharisees, who weren't John's biggest fans, realized the momentum that was being picked up in Jesus's ministry, and they didn't like that either. And Jesus, throughout the Gospel of John, is always kind of conscious about the timing that things are unfolding in his ministry. We saw this back in John chapter 2 at the wedding, whenever Jesus told his mom, hey, it's not my time yet. And he'll talk about time throughout the Gospel because he wants to walk in step with his Father God's plan that he had for him. So he realized, hey, things are kind of boiling up and it seems like the best thing for now is to travel up to Galilee. Now, in verse four there, it tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria to get there. And there have been some people, if you just look at this map here, you can see kind of the layout of the land, that kind of turquoise color down there uh, towards the bottom in the middle there. That is Judea. And then uh, the lime green up there at top. I'm not good with color, so follow me, I hope. Uh, That is Galilee. And that big purple blob in the middle, that is Samaria. And the shortest distance between two points is a? Okay, some of you didn't know that. If you didn't know that on this side of the room, I didn't hear it as much. Our students informed me that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If you'd like to try that, you can get your bulletin and do two dots and then draw a line. And you can see that actually happen. So if you want to travel from Judea to Galilee, the shortest distance to to do that would be to travel through Samaria, right? Right? It makes sense if you just look at the map. But there have been people for a while that have made a really big deal about Jesus' choice to travel through here, saying that that it was extremely abnormal for a Jew to travel through Samaria. Now, this may have been the case for some pious Jews, some of the Pharisees. Maybe they didn't travel through there. But one thing that that I learned this week from a Jewish historian, a guy named Josephus, who lived when the New Testament was being written, is that it was common for Jews from Galilee, like Jesus, to travel through Samaria. 
So whether it was abnormal for Jesus' path to go through Samaria or not, what is extremely out of the ordinary is what Jesus does while he travels through Samaria. And to see that, we're going to pick things up in verse 7. So we see Jesus traveling through there. We see he stopped at this well at about noon. And verse 7 says this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. As we look at this point here, I think we see the first major point here to draw out about how Jesus lived and loved in his life. And the first point I want us to see here is that Jesus' mission was bigger than just one people group or nation. See, Jesus' mission was bigger than just engaging with those who were like him. Jesus' mission was bigger than just being the savior for the people of Israel. Rather, as we'll see at the end of chapter four, Jesus came and he was the savior of the entire world. He came to engage all of those around him, not just the entire world. And this has been God's heartbeat since the beginning. If you want to know more about God's heart for the nations, I encourage you to go to MomentumYes.com. Check out the six-week course there, which talks about this heart of God for the nations and how that has been seen throughout history. But right here in this passage, we see a little bit about it as Jesus steps outside of his cultural norms to engage with this woman. Now, it would have been extremely strange for a Jewish man like Jesus to have a conversation with any woman outside of his wife and Jesus was single. So this was a very abnormal conversation, but not just having a conversation with a woman, but having a conversation with her in private. In fact, you can see the surprise on the disciples' face if you jump down there to verse 27. When the disciples came back, it says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But he wasn't just talking with a woman, right? He was talking to a Samaritan woman. And what did the end of verse 9 tell us? It told us that Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And yet here Jesus is engaging with a Samaritan woman. Now to understand the disdain that Jews had for Samaritans and vice versa, that's something I think we probably hear quite a bit about if you come to the church because some stories that involve Samaritans. But one thing sometimes I think we miss is that this was the culmination of 700 years of bad blood. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 17, you can see in verses 23 through 41, the beginnings of this bad blood between Jews and Samaritans. But that kind of culminates in verse 41. So I just want us to read 2 Kings 17 verse 41 to see how these Samaritans are described. Here is what the author of 2 Kings writes. He says, even while these people, the Samaritans, were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Now, 700 years later, as Jesus comes on the scene, that same statement is true of these Samaritans. They claim to worship the one true God, and yet they worship other idols. They actually break the first two commandments that God gives his people in Israel. But not only was this woman different than Jesus and that she was a woman and a Samaritan woman, but we see that this woman was actually marginalized in her own society. And there are two hints towards this that we see in this passage. First comes by the time of day that she comes to the well. It told us that it was about noon, right? Which was in the heat of the day. And while it was common for women to be the ones who would go and collect water, they would often do this either in the morning or late afternoon when it had cooled down a little bit for the day. So they would go at these times because, well, if you go in the middle of the day carrying water, it kind of defeats the purpose because then you have to drink more water, right? So she went at this time of the day, which shows a little bit about this marginalization. The second hint we have in this story is that she went to the well alone. Because the women who went either in the morning or late in the afternoon, what often happened was this would be their social time together. 
I read something this week that was talking about how women often look forward to this time because it was the one time during the day where they didn't have to mess with kids anymore. It was the one time during the day when they didn't have anything else going on. They just had to have, go collect this water. And it was an opportunity to go and do this together. And yet this woman shows up in the heat of the day all by herself, telling us something about her relationship with others in her society. Here we see a second important point about Jesus' engagement with his mission, how Jesus lived in love. And it's this, that Jesus' mission engages the marginalized. The marginalized are those who are often overlooked and forgotten. And Jesus' mission intentionally engaged this woman who was in this situation. And God calls us to do the exact same today. God's heart for his people has always been to engage with the marginalized and vulnerable people. And we, as a leadership here at Crossroads, hope that this becomes something that is just part of our everyday life. That it's not something we have to think about doing. It's not something that happens on special weekends. But it's something that happens each and every week and each and every day. So that's why we hope to offer practical steps each and every week. But every now and then we sense opportunities to have what are kind of landmark opportunities to take steps towards seeing this happen in our lives. This is why this last fall, whenever we did the Let's Do This series, we closed out the series by preaching an abbreviated message and then sending our body out with that extra time to love on those around them because we hope this becomes part of our DNA. And we think this weekend too could be another one of those landmark opportunities as we can put a stake in the ground as a church to say, yes, we're going to be intentional to engage with a marginalized and underserved people in an underserved region of our world, which we'll talk about with this Transform a Village initiative here in a little bit. Now, as we move on, we pick things up in verse 10, where Jesus responds to this woman after we find out that Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus responds in verse 10 by saying this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now here, Jesus kind of flips the the tables here. He flips the conversation around. If you remember, the conversation started with Jesus asking this woman for water. But now Jesus makes an offer to this woman to give her this living water. This water that would take away that thirst forever. Now, whenever we see this engagement, I think Jesus makes an offer to this woman that he makes to each and every one of us. Only I think if Jesus were to have the conversation with some of us, the conversation wouldn't be around thirst. It would be around something else. Maybe God's conversation with you, Jesus would engage you around the idea of rest. You run at such a pace in your life where you're just trying to reach this point where someday you will be able to slow down and rest. And if Jesus were speaking to you, he would say, hey, if you knew the gift of God and the one who who it is who you're speaking to, then you would see, as he says in Matthew 11, that he has come to give you rest. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe for you, the conversation would be around contentment. You think if I just get this next thing, then I will finally be content. Whether it's the new iPhone, new job, new whatever it is, new pay grade, whatever that thing is that you are striving after. And he would say to you, hey, if you knew the gift that it is that God has for you, and if you knew the one you talked to, then you would recognize that I have come to give you contentment. I have come to show you the secret to being content, as Paul talks about in Philippians 4, and that is to find your fulfillment in Christ. Here, I think we see in this woman's response that Jesus' words here kind of went over her head, just like Jesus' words to uh, Nicodemus in John 3 went over his head as well. If you remember in John 3, Jesus starts talking about new birth and Nicodemus is like, how on earth am I going to be born again if I've already been born? That doesn't make sense. And here, this woman responds to Jesus' words about this living water. And I can imagine just kind of paraphrasing her words, talking to Jesus is being something like this, Uh, um, Jesus, uh, yeah, you remember how this conversation started, right? Uh, You came to me and said, hey, give me some water. 
And now you're acting like this whole time you've had some magical water source, right? Where on earth was this living water five minutes ago when you asked me for water, right? That makes no sense. Why would you say, give me water and then say, oh, by the way, here's the trick in the hat. It's not a rabbit, it's living water. How great is this? But whenever we see this encounter, we see what this woman is just really thrown off. But Jesus shows that he has a greater gift. And it shows us, I think, the, the a third thing about Jesus' mission and something that's really unique about Jesus' mission. And it's this, that Jesus' mission fulfills the deeper need and desires of our heart. The thing that we're longing for to have filled in our heart that we try to fill with so many things in our life is designed to be fulfilled by Jesus. Jesus unpacks this a little bit in verses 13 and 14, whenever he says this. He says, everyone drinks of this water. This water that the woman has in the well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring welling up into eternal life. Jesus offers this type of fulfillment that goes beyond what this woman could even imagine. And Jesus' words seem was like a, sort of like a hyperlink back to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, who was speaking on behalf of God to the people of Israel about a day to come. In Isaiah 55, verse 1, he says this, he says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Isaiah was pointing forward to this day when God's kingdom would come like it did in Christ, when people would experience that fulfillment they so longed for. And Jesus shows that this can only come through experiencing this living water that he offers. Now this spring of water that Jesus mentions points us to a picture of the Holy Spirit, which we'll see Jesus make explicit in John chapter 7. I think it's verses 37 through 39, somewhere around there where Jesus says, hey, this spring of water I'm talking about is the Holy Spirit that brings about life. You see, it is through this new birth that comes about through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are actually empowered to live on mission. Because the reason Jesus was able to live with such a self-giving love, such a self-sacrificing love, is that Jesus was operating from a place of knowing his sure and secure identity. See, Jesus wasn't working for identity, but if you pop to the end of Matthew chapter 4 and you see Jesus' baptism, or end of chapter 3 in Matthew, you see Jesus' baptism and you see God say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And that's where Jesus worked for. And we often work from a place where instead of working from having our identity secure, we're working towards thinking, if I can just do this one more thing, I will secure identity. But I'm here to tell you that unless you find your identity in Jesus, you can't live in love like God calls you to live in love. That's the final thing I think we need to see here. And that is that our mission is to live in love like Jesus. So our mission too is to be bigger than just the nation we live in. Our mission is to actually engage with the marginalized. And our mission is to point to the one who brings about ultimate fulfillment. So one question we're wrestling through today is what would it look like for us to live in love like Jesus? What would it look like for us to engage the marginalized? One thing we see throughout Jesus's ministry is that Jesus actually uh, engaged with people and he didn't pit physical need against spiritual need. But he often engaged with both, showing that the deeper need was surely something he came for, but he didn't come just ignoring the physical need as well. And I can't speak to what an obedient step looks like for everyone in this room to this story here today. But one step we believe God is calling us to as a church, so collectively as a body which means not every individual will be involved in this step and that's okay. But one thing he's calling us to as a body is to sponsor over 200 kids in Kenya. Today, we're gonna explore this opportunity of child sponsorship that we have. That's bigger than just partnering with a child. It's part of actually transforming a village. And we think this is a unique opportunity to take a step towards living and loving like Jesus in our world. 
Now our partners, Africa Hope, work with the Maasai people in rural Kenya. And they work uh, with these people who the Maasai have long been known as these fierce hunters and warriors. But as the world has changed, they've become more herders who take their um, cattle and they kind of go on a, a like free range type style. They roam back and forth throughout the land wherever there's food for their cattle. These people also operate on a a bartering economic system where they uh, kind of trade rather than having a cash-based system. And the Maasai people are uh, an extremely proud people. But the last few decades and even last century, the world has changed at such a pace that their way of life is becoming something that's forcing them to become even more marginalized. It's kind of forcing them away from God's uh, design for them, that they're no longer able to flourish as a people. You see, the government in Kenya believes that in order for them to no longer be a third world country, they need to monetize the land that they have. So they're doing that by breaking up the land between different landowners, which is completely disrupting the way of life for these people who have traditionally roamed with their cattle. Additionally, it's changing the economic system from one of the bartering system that we just mentioned to now being one that is almost forced into a cash system, which with a people who've never been educated or practiced in this type of system, it's extremely challenging to figure out how to live in this changing world. See, economically, the people that we are working with are in what is called extreme poverty. Which one definition talks about how this is people who live on under $2 a day, but New International and Africa Hope, they actually use a a system called the Multidimensional Poverty Index, which is just as fun as it sounds to read about. But it's this index that really measures both the intensity of poverty that people are in to understand, okay, how extreme is the poverty? And then also measures the number of people in poverty. And the system is built around three key areas. It's built around education. It's built around health. It's built around standard of living. So whenever they talk about education, they go in and ask the question, are all school age children enrolled in school? Another question they'll ask is, is there anyone in their family, including parents, who have had five years of schooling? Whenever they start looking at health, they look at the nutrition of the family members or many of them malnourished. They'll look at the the question of child mortality rates and how many families have experienced or which families have experienced the loss of a child between uh, a, a mother being seven months pregnant and the child's fifth birthday. This index gives us a glimpse into the picture of just how intense this poverty is. In addition to this extreme poverty piece, another thing we know is that the families in this larger region we're working in are 24 times more likely to follow traditional uh, non-Christian religions compared to other parts in Kenya. And so we are engaging with a people who don't have access always to the gospel. So if we are going to engage with these people, we believe that God is calling us to cross some barriers. Now, right now, I'm excited to have Andrea Crosland from here at Crossroads and Jason Simonson from New International join me on stage where we will continue this conversation a little bit. Now, as we do this, I um, had the opportunity, it'll be two years ago in May, to go to Kenya with uh, Tom Webster and Jack Arney to try to look at what was going on there and start talking about what our next steps and our partnership could be. And I'm excited because today is the culmination of prayers that started before I even went to Kenya, where there were people who were invested in this ministry that started praying long ago for an opportunity for Crossroads to engage like this. So I'm excited for this weekend, Andrea. Jason, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Andrew, I thought we could start with you. Could you uh, talk a little bit about how long Crossroads has been partnered with Africa Hope and then how you and your family got involved? Sure. So Crossroads has been in partnership with Africa Hope for 11 years. So 11 year, over those 11 years, uh, Crossroads groups have taken 11 short-term mission trips to Kenya and engaged with Africa Hope in their communities. Our family got involved in 2016 on our first short-term mission trip when our sons were 11 and 13 years old. And we have an older daughter, but she wasn't able to go with us. And so... Um, 
We really saw this as a bucket list item for us. This was gonna be a one and done activity that we did together as a family. We were really excited to give our sons a global perspective and also just to be the hands and feet of Jesus together as a family, which was really important to us. And if you've never served together as a family or taken a short term mission trip together as a family, I really recommend it. It is truly a blessing. But as we, as we went through that experience, um, just what we experienced in Kenya and the relationships we started to build, our hearts were just really wrecked and we fell in love with Kenya. So God had a different plan for us than a one and done bucket list activity. And so when we got home, we joined the Africa Hope Leadership Team, which is a group here at Crossroads. And we meet monthly, we pray for our partners, um, we plan the next year's short-term mission trip and, and other events like Presents for Partners that we do closer to Christmas time. Um, and then later, my husband, Michael, and I had the opportunity to lead that group, and so we do that as well. But it really is, it really is about relationships. So whether it's with Tim and Lorna Montai, who lead Africa Hope, whether it's with Pastor Tom and Eunice, who are weekly, if not daily, out in the communities that Africa Hope serves, or Edith, who has such a beautiful singing voice, or Ben, who makes the most delicious food for us when we're there at the Hope Center, we know them and they know us. Um, even when we were as a church uh, going through the process of finding our new lead pastor, Africa Hope was praying right alongside us. That's, that's just the kind of relationship that we I have. I love that relationship. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Jason, um, we've heard New International, who I know they've been around for 31 years, but you guys just had a name change, which makes it feel brand new. Uh, we've heard Africa Hope, and then we know Crossroads as a church. We're trying to come together. Can you help us understand the relationship between those three organizations and also what your role is with New International? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so New International, uh, we are a mission-sending agency. So we're a collection of over 200 missionaries and ministries in 42 countries. Um, one of the ministries that are a part of New International um, is Africa Hope. And uh, child sponsorship is another one of those. I am the director of child sponsorship, which means I just get to serve and bless my team and, and serve Africa Hope and, and act as a bridge between crossroaders and children in Kenya uh, that need help. Um, Africa Hope is an amazing ministry of, of world changers uh, from all age groups. They have been in the community uh, for uh, a long, long time. Uh, many, many of these staff of Africa Hope are from the very villages that children are being sponsored from. One of the things that I love about Africa Hope is uh, 30 years ago, in, in this main village that they work in, we had uh, 1,000 people that were there and there were only two Christians. Today, because of the work of Africa Hope, there's about 10,000 people. That's not really their work that there's more people. That's those people's work, <laughs> but there's, there's 10,000 people, but there are over 7,000 people following wow. Jesus because they did exactly what Jesus okay. Christ would have wanted them to do. That's awesome. And a lot of them are, they're older and a lot of them are younger. And so to my white shirted friends over here, guys, it is never too young to start changing the world. And we all have that opportunity today to work together and change the world through child sponsorship. That's awesome. Now, Andrea, can you share with uh, us for a second what you do for a living? Yeah, sure. So I uh, consult with companies um, primarily in the chemical industry to drive their profitability through operational and business process excellence. Man, doesn't that sound like a blast? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, just so you guys know, um, Andrea holds a PhD in chemistry from Florida. Uh, I'm a UK fan, so thankfully Kentucky won yesterday or I would be sitting a little bit closer over here. Um, but Andrea, uh, can you just share with us for a second with your background looking at process and all that, how did that maybe shape the way you evaluated this opportunity to engage with child sponsorship? Yeah, so in my work, it's really important to understand variables and inputs and how those tie to your intended outcome. So when we started looking at what the Child Sponsorship Program does and the Multidimensional Poverty Index, also understanding the direct give model where the money goes straight to the families. Um, and, and that's the new sort of modern way of, of attacking the root causes of extreme poverty. We knew that they were onto something. And so not only are they employing those methods, the, they also 
also are doing training and mentorship with the primary guardian of the child that's sponsored. So that's, that's typically the mamas, but when you look at the effects of what the direct give model can do and then also what the effects of the training and mentoring does as well, you get sort of an amplified effect, which is really, which is really fantastic. That's yeah. awesome. Yep. So, Jason, can you maybe build on that and help us understand how uh, sponsoring a child, so you're sponsoring one child, how does that help come together for this idea of transforming a village? Because that can seem like kind of a leap, right, to go from, oh, yeah, I'm sponsoring one child to a village being transformed. Seems yeah. like two different things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my last trip to Kenya, uh, I met with somebody who said something to me that changed the trajectory of my life, and this was last year. 30 years ago when there was 1,000 people in this village, Kenya had experienced uh, the most severe drought in their history. Dozens of children passed away during this drought. Last year, they had a, a drought of equal severity. And so I traveled to Kenya, and, and I, I thought I was going there to, to attend some funerals. I, I didn't know what we could do to help, and, and I showed up at the village, and you can imagine I'm sitting inside a really small home with, with mud walls and uh, sitting on a mud floor and talking to one of the village elders, and I said, oh, so how did it go? How, how was the drought? He said, Jason, it was fine. And I said, what do you mean it was fine? And he said, the mothers in this village took this sponsorship program and they took the funding that, and the training that they received and they made sure that every single child had food and water every day of the drought. They said, Jason, we did not lose a single child this drought. Wow. It was incredible. God has been so good to us and so good to them. And I think part of the reason for that is our program is different from other programs and then we empower mothers to make great decisions for their children. So what we do is when a child is sponsored, we immediately enroll that mother in a financial training course to teach her all the basics of budgeting and saving and planning. And then instead of giving her restrictions, we just give her the money, money and let her do what she knows is best. Because I'm just like a goofy white dude from Michigan. I don't know what's best for their children, but they do. And so we use a direct give program where we just give the, the mothers and the families money to take care of the children. And it has worked amazingly. In fact, there's a young woman that I met in Kenya. Um, she actually served me lunch, which was very humbling to have somebody in extreme poverty buy you lunch. But I was sitting there and she was telling me her story. During the drought, um, she, so she's a widow and she has four children. And during the drought, she used the sponsorship money to take care of her entire neighborhood. About 60 children were fed and wa had water every day because of her. And she didn't just stop there. She took it a step further and she used any extra water and any, any extra money that she had to plant some crops in the area so that when the drought was over, she and her neighborhood had food that would last them the rest of the, uh, the year that year. It is incredible. And so one of the questions I get asked is, can, can $30 a month actually make a difference? I mean, poverty is so huge, right? Can $30 actually make a difference? If we were to ask this mother named Modu, can $30 a month make a difference? I think she'd say, uh, you're darn right, it can make a difference. <laughs> $30 a month can change an entire little community there. And with each of these children that are sponsored, it transforms their families, which transforms entire villages. And my vision is if we get enough villages transformed, we can see entire communities, entire regions, eventually entire nations transformed in the name of Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome to give the young people in this church and in our lives the inheritance of a world without extreme poverty? That would be amazing. And so we have that opportunity today to do that. You'll see a whole bunch of bright orange shirt people out there. Come and talk to us. Sponsor a child. Change the world with us. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. No. Yeah. I've heard that story now like five or six times. And every time I hear it, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. This is awesome. Um, Andrew, will you help us uh, kind of understand? We've kind of got a, a really tight arrow on what we're aiming for, for Crossroads global vision and strategy. So how does this fit into that global vision and strategy? Yeah. So Crossroads global outreach uh, goal is that in order to live and love like Jesus, um, we are engaging the hopeless and the vulnerable 
by speaking and demonstrating the good news of Jesus here, near, and far away. And so when we look at the definitions of who is hopeless, who, is, who are the vulnerable, hope, the hopeless are those who either aren't experiencing new life in Jesus or have little to no access to learn about him. And, and similarly, um, those who are vulnerable are those who are susceptible to either physical, emotional, or spiritual harm, likely due to circumstances that, that may be beyond their control. And so when you look at this program, it really addresses both of those descriptors. So if you, you look, for example, at the trip, um, the Crossroads trip that we took last summer to Kenya, we were in a community called Olagirno, and it is way far out. So Africa Hope purposefully targets um, communities that are, are far away. It's hard to reach places, it, harsh conditions. There's no running water. There's no electricity. We were over an hour away from the closest road. Um, but that's where they operate. That's where they're taking the love of Jesus. Um, and, and so um, when we're out there, it, it, it doesn't matter that we're out there and we're laughing with the mamas and we're playing with the kids and we're, we're building desks for their school and their church. So when we got out there, the kids, you know, for school, they sit on rock, they were sitting on rocks like about this big. That's how they did school. Um, and also, you know, doing a vacation Bible school program with fun games and activities. And, and we just, we do life with them. And it's, it's so beautiful. And, I, you know, the thing that, the, so this was, that was, the picture was our, our group that was out there last summer at Old Girno. Um, the thing that's, that's so beautiful to me is that, that when you're out there, when we're out there, you can see what it's going to be like in the kingdom of God. You can see what it's going to be like when every tongue and every nation is together and that we get to praise God and enjoy him forever, uh, forever. Us right next to our Maasai brothers and sisters and everybody else in the world. But you can see that and you can experience just a little bit of it when you're out there. So that's why this is just such a blessing. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrea and Jason. Will you guys join me in thanking them yeah, thank for being with us this weekend. Now, if you want to talk more with them, they will be out in the atrium. They can answer questions that you may have. As the family ministries pastor here, one of the reasons I got really excited about this opportunity that we have is thinking back to my own childhood. And I've shared this with you all before, but um, we sponsored kids whenever I was growing up. My parents would select kids and we would uh, have them on the refrigerator. And one thing I loved that my parents did is they were intentional to have the conversation with us. Hey, hey, Andrew, Jonathan, Beth, Sarah, Deborah. Ruth, hey, we are going without this so that we can sponsor this child across the globe. They would sometimes take the name of the child off of the refrigerator. And as we were having dinner, they would invite us to pray for that kid as we were getting ready for dinner. So they brought us into part of the process. And that's part of the reason why I see the world the way that I do today. So one of the dreams I have is for our Crossroads families to have that type of experience for kids to begin to see what God is doing around the world and to maybe start identifying with someone who lives a couple of airplane rides around the world from a very young age. Now, my family and I chose the child we are going to sponsor last night, and he's over here. Um, but this is Meshach, and Meshach was born the same year as my son, who turns three on Tuesday, and Meshach is throwing a fit in this picture, okay? So I selected this picture because I'm like, I just saw that picture the other day whenever I waited till eight o'clock instead of putting my kid down at 7.30. So I think this is the child just for me. So if you and your family do decide to make this choice, uh, you can select a child out there. But right now I wanna invite you, if you're at the end of a row, to pass those cards down the row to the other side. Now I wanna make this clear right now. This is not the only way for you to respond faithfully to today's message. There are a ton of ways that you can live and love like Jesus, where you can begin living on mission with Jesus, which means that you care about more than just one nation or people group. You see God's heart for the nations. There's more than just one way to engage with the marginalized. And if this isn't for you and your family right now, that is 100% okay. 
But if this is something that you and your family decide to do, you can fill out that form there on the bottom of that. And then whenever you exit the worship center, you will find children's faces on tables out there. And you can pair your, uh, your paper there with the child there. And you'll get to take a picture of that child home. And then you can drop that in the secure lockbox out there with that information. And uh, that will go on from there. Right now, what I want to do is take a second just to pray for us. And I'll give us some more instructions. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for being a good God who invites us into being on mission with you. God, this is an exciting weekend for us as a church body as we think about what it looks like for us to walk faithfully with you, to love those across the world the way that you have loved us, God. So would you lead and guide each and every person here in understanding what their steps are. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.